All right. We are finally here with Jesse Marseille. Uh, how are you doing, man, today? So I'm good doing to have really you. well. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for having me on. This is great. I'm so excited about this conversation because you're also a fellow podcaster. We, I listened to your episode 11 uh, on your podcast, the Storytelling at the Scale, um, which I highly recommend everyone to tune in. I listened to that episode, which is your first solo episode, if I believe, and you thoroughly go through the details, but I love everyone to get to know you, get to know a little bit about your story, and we take it from there. Well, I'm happy to do that, and I think a good place to start is just where I started to get obsessed with this idea of stories, which started well before my career began. I think like a lot of kids, I was very lucky to have a dad that read to me and a bunch of the classics from Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter books and also getting into Greek mythology and the Iliad and the Odyssey and Hindu mythology. Like he really read broadly from different world religions, different cultures, European folklore, tribal stories from the Australian bush, like so like such a wide range of stories. And when you're a little kid, all of those stories feel real and they feel possible and exciting. And you can, you have the imagination that you can put yourself in any of them. You can imagine yourself as a samurai in feudal Japan. You can imagine yourself a hunter out there in the plains of Central Africa. You can imagine these different narratives coming to life. And so when I was that age and I was conceptualizing what adulthood meant, it was generally this envisioning of what kind of story was I going to inhabit and what kind of hero was I going to be. And somewhere along the way, I lost track of those stories and instead started living out a very pedestrian narrative around basically being a tech employee and helping venture back startups gain market share and gain perceived value and help investors and occasionally a founder get super rich. And I'm really not in any place of judgment of how anybody wants to live their life as long as they're not hurting other people. But for me, working in those kinds of roles never would have been the story that I imagined. Those were not, that didn't fit into the stories that I got excited about when my dad was reading to me. That didn't feel like a just cause to fight for. It didn't feel like I had a lot of emotional investment in the work that I was doing. And it didn't feel creative. And so I started to get very depressed and my coping mechanisms for dealing with that depression just weren't healthy. And there was substance abuse aspects. There was just shutting myself in and isolating myself emotionally, not doing the things that I find joy in because I just started to take on this belief that life doesn't really have joy. It's just about getting through the day. And as I continued to live that way over the course of several years, six, seven years, eventually I just hit this breaking point where I had this realization of, no, I, that cannot be my life story. It cannot be, I can't be the protagonist of that narrative. That's not a cause worth fighting for, for me. And that's when things started to change and I started to get reinvigorated by this concept of stories. And one of the things that was really gratifying about it was paying attention to other people's stories and asking them about their life took pressure off of me because I was so worked up in my own ego and about what I'm doing and my purpose and am I living up to my potential? It just, it became very, very overbearing my uh, on i was overbearing on myself and it was hard to make creative decisions from there and so by shifting the focus 
starting to talk to other people and ultimately get the idea for my podcast where I interview people and have them tell their stories. It was like such a relief to shift the focus and work with empathy and compassion that way and, and develop greater sensitivity to what other people are dealing with. And that kind of brought me to where I am now. <laughs> that is a very inspiring story. And I've been uh, uh, lucky to see parts of it. I can also say, like, hearing some of the stories that are shared on your podcast, like, it's really bringing that empathy out. You're digging deep. What has been some of the biggest outcome of that for you so far? You're almost 25 episodes in. Uh, what does that even mean? Like, what did it bring to your life? If you can picture that for us. Yeah, it's a really, really good question. So one thing that it's brought back into my life is the ability to follow my curiosity. I think business and technology was interesting for a relatively short time, especially because there was I could easily imagine how I could make money doing it. And so I was like, yeah, I'm interested in that. And I'll follow that path for a while. But unless you are truly passionate about something, eventually your curiosity will wear off. And so by shifting my focus away from technology, away from business into the podcast and into people, I gained access to this infinite pool of curiosity that I have, which is ultimately my curiosity about the human condition, which never ends. That That is endless. You know, What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to exist as a mortal and face certain death? How do we cope with that? How do we build relationships in spite of the fact that everything is temporary? How do we choose what to spend our life on? These are questions that I don't think have singular answers that people answer in all kinds of very interesting and dynamic ways. And so for me, it's a privilege to be able to follow my curiosity and just get people's answers. And I just want to keep going. Please do. Please do. Because uh, we, need, we need a lot of those stories coming out the way you're doing it. I'm curious. Uh, you mentioned curiosity. Do you have like a specific ways to kind of like digest these things for yourself? Like how do you like follow that curiosity and bring it into action or somehow want to plan sort of an action plan for it in future? Like, do you have a process? Is there, is there a way um, you like to share with us? Yeah. So really interesting questions. And there's a few categories of what I'm doing that I could focus on and how I answer. But like the first element is just the stories themselves. People from throughout history, from every part of the earth, pretty much all of the inhabited land of the planet have stories that they've passed on through generations as oral traditions and eventually as written traditions. And almost all of them carry a few commonalities. A central hero is a very, very, very common <laughs> device, literary device. But beyond just having a central hero, so many stories have that hero born into a moment of stability and calm and then have that calm disrupted and taken away in some way. And sometimes it's taken away by their own actions. Sometimes it's by things that are out of their control. But we have this image of the Buddha born into relative wealth and luxury as a prince and being in the stable walled gardens of his palace and then going out into the world and having that vision of stability disrupted. This is also true of Jesus Christ. This is also true of King Arthur. This is true of so many literary figures. And so that moment of crossing over the threshold from being in the place of calm to suddenly recognizing 
the challenge of the world, the discomfort of the world, the reality of pain and suffering. That's a very common theme. And that's really the first stage of so many of these stories. And so when I'm look talking to a guest, a lot of times I'm trying to understand the context of the stability that they were in first. Like where where is our vantage point? And then how was that stability broken? What event caused you to become witness to the reality of the difficulty of life? And then there's many devices past there. I mean, almost all of these heroes from history meet a guide it's like you know luke skywalker meets yoda frodo meets gandalf like it just it goes on and on right so a guide is like a very 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 common one and in people's real lives you know the guide could be a sponsor at an aa meeting the guide could just be a a really good boss that you had it could it could be anything it could be absolutely anybody um but i look for where people found that guide. And so anyway, you know, I could go on for a long time about these different devices that exist within storytelling, but that framework of the hero's journey is one that I definitely think about, even if I'm not following it bit by bit chronologically, when I'm interviewing someone, I am mapping it kind of in the background as I go. This is awesome. It's, it's not only a a good platform for you to find pieces of this story it's also a good uh, platform to deliver that story and i i love that uh, we also with a couple of our guests in previous episodes we talked about uh, joseph campbell and it, uh, the, yeah. uh, the hero with thousand faces uh, that came up a lot and i love i love this like this is this is part of like almost what both of us are doing i'm kind of actually curious just because you said it what was the guide in your experience in your journey Oh my gosh. Wow. (laughs) Really, really, really good question. Okay. So I have been very, very lucky to have probably a dozen key mentors throughout my life, each of which helped me along different dimensions of this journey. And so I had a guitar teacher when I was very young. Um, maybe 10, 11 years old, Sam Prestiani, if you're out there, I talk to him every once in a while. So (laughs) Sam is great. Um, he just shared with me a love of music and just demonstrated how much he loved to play music and share music. And just that learning something and studying something could be fun and school. He was also my English teacher, but he taught guitar like private lessons just kind of as like an an additional way to make some money. And he found some of his students through the school. And so that's how I met him. And it's like, I liked his English class and he was a good English teacher, but like, to be honest, most of school was pretty boring. But then to have this person just share like how much they could love studying something and music gets pretty academic. Well, you got to read the notes and keep time and all of that. And like, you know, it's, it, it is intellectual. And so that for me, having him as a guide of like, no studying and learning actually can be very fun. That stayed with me for the rest of my life. I worked with him for a few years as a guitar student, but his mentorship continues to impact me to this day. And I've just had a lot of guides like that throughout my life. And I've sought them out. Like I've actively looked for them. If you want to help us see characteristics of a good mentor how do you think we can approach finding a mentor and what are some of the characteristics that we can see in someone and say hey uh this person can be my mentor maybe maybe uh, i should be asking them i also have a follow-up question on how to ask people to be our mentor but let's leave that for uh, the characteristic question first so what i would ask is what are the characteristics of a good mentee what is the characteristics of a good student. Most of the time when people are saying, I'm having trouble finding a good mentor, it's because they have blockages that are stopping them from actually accepting wisdom from people. Most of the time, because there are good mentors everywhere. 
You can go to a jujitsu gym and find a great instructor. You can find a music teacher. You can cold call, cold message somebody on LinkedIn. You will be surprised at people's willingness to help you if you ask. I think one of the things that has helped me is I look for people who are playing the game in a way that I respect and admire, whatever that game is. And then I willingly submit to their expertise and fully allow their wisdom to come through without my filter. And I think, you know, we live in this age of like a democratization of knowledge and everyone has access to information on the internet and all of that stuff. It's not what it's about. It's about a transmission of energy. Yes, they might know some facts that can help you, but you can probably find those facts somewhere else. It's actually about hearing them specifically from that person. And so the first thing is like, you've got to be willing to submit to their expertise and let them relay the information in the way that makes sense for them. And if you're just going to have this attitude of like, ah, I'm not buying it or like, how do I know it's really true? Well, then you didn't find a person who's actually playing the game the way that you admire. So you have to find someone who's playing the game the way that you admire. And then you have to let them just give you the information. And then I think the final thing is like, it's a vibe check. Like, do you, how does it feel to receive the information from them? So, you know, the best, the best mentors, they don't really need anything from you. And like paying for coaching is totally fine. I've paid, I've paid all of my coaches and it's been worth like, like I've learned from people that are not like my paid coaches, but like I have formally been coached by a lot of people, like a dozen people. And it's always been worth every dollar. So if you're doubting whether it's worth it, then just stop paying for it. This is uh, awesome. I love how you categorized it as you were uh, sharing your thoughts on it. It made me also think of a couple of very good mentors I had in my life. You said vibe check, and that was like the punchline for me. Like at the end of the day, there's something in that person that you can appreciate and admire, as you said, and that makes you really feel that vibe that, oh, this guy or this lady, they seem to know what they're talking about. I want to I wanna just listen for a few days. I want to just see what they're saying because uh, I think... Oftentimes, those blockages are caused by the fact that we think we know the answer. And when somebody tells us there is more questions to look at rather than thinking about answers, that to me is a vibe that I'm looking at like, oh, somebody is actually asking different questions today rather than trying to convince me with an answer. This professor or this a jiu-jitsu teacher or this person or that person, they are giving me a new lens to start taking my camera and go out and take pictures. And that, of course, like as it, uh, with curiosity, but I think to me that reminded me of what kind of people I'm looking for. Do you have your own sort of laha moments with people who can be your mentor or your coach, as you said, you've been uh, taking coaching from other folks as well like do you have an aha moment that works for you yeah i mean i'm like really weird with this stuff i think everybody's different so like my answer applies to me and maybe some other people but definitely not everybody so what i need on a coach is not what everybody else needs but like i like when a coach checks me on my bs and i don't mind being told in pretty direct terms, what I need to do. And I don't mind being told that what I've been doing is the wrong choice and will not get me the results I want. Like when I am paying for a coach, like I actually do, I want them to ask questions. Yes, for sure. Cause it's through that process of inquiry that we find our own truth. But I also think that it's worth hearing what your coach thinks the right answer is. Because they should have more experience than me. That's why I'm 
working with them. It doesn't mean I have to do what they say, but I don't want them to mince words. I want to, them to hear what it is. And again, there's other like coaching frameworks that are more based on nonviolent communication where really the coach is a sounding board and you are finding your own answers through the conversation. And that's totally fine. I respect that a hundred percent. It's not the kind of coaching I look for anymore, but like, again, this is not, there is no one size fits all with this. I, I can ask so many questions about this topic. Uh, but, uh, I think what's, kind of like interesting for me to also know uh a little bit about your story like uh, if you want to share a little bit more on um, that aha moment that you felt oh i i need to get out of uh, tech there there is a full episode on your podcast but for folks who are not familiar with a little bit of that story if you don't mind sharing a little bit of that aha moment that would be great for me the physical symptoms became completely unignorable. So there's a great book, The Body Keeps the Score, about how trauma and emotions get stored in your nervous system and other bodily systems and create physical consequences. And so I started to get very, very sick about six years into my tech sales career. I started breaking out in this skin, basically this like skin reaction, these like sores on the outside of my face, on my hands, on my feet. They're super painful. They looked like, I mean, they looked like what I imagine like leprosy looks like, like these like open weeping sores are very unsightly. They're also on the inside of my mouth. So it was really hard to eat or drink water. First day I woke up with them. It was like, I went to sleep feeling fine and I woke up with like a sores all over my face. I was like, what the hell is going on? So I go to the hospital, of course, and they run me through a bunch of tests and they all come back negative for everything. Like no answers. I'm like, okay, I don't know what it is. I go, th they escalate me. I go through a bunch more tests. Everything is negative. They put me on antibiotics. They put me on antivirals because they don't know what it is. And after about a week and a half, the sores went away. I was like, okay, well, we have no answers, but at least they're gone. About three months later, it happened again. And then another two months later. So every two, three, four months at the most, I started breaking out in these reactions. It would put me out of work for like two weeks. I did, basically could only consume food like through a straw. Couldn't walk around, couldn't go outside. Since we didn't know what it was, we didn't know if I was contagious, so I had to quarantine myself. So I would quarantine myself in one room of the apartment away from my wife. It was really, really, really uncomfortable. And this went on for about two years. And one day I had this episode that was like so bad, like so bad, just like sores all over my face, all over my hands, on my feet, the insides of my legs. It was like, mind-blowingly painful and i had to go to the er just for like just so they could like treat the pain and i'm like we had moved to a new state so it was like okay i have to reestablish care here i have to tell them like hey we have this disease we don't really know what it is this happens every once in a while and I just made the decision in that moment, like driving home from the ER after a few hours of like, I'm going to figure out what this is. And so after I recovered from that episode, I got really, really, really intense about finding specialists in different autoimmune diseases, skin diseases, like everything we could figure out. And I went through a bunch of different doctors but eventually this one specialist um, in Portland, Oregon, was able to actually figure out what it is. It's a disease called erythema multiform. It's a condition. People have genetic predispositions for it. So it's not contagious. It's like something your body either kind of has or doesn't have. For most people that are having reactions, it comes on when your immune system is lowered by another disease process. 
HIV being a very common one, which I was negative for, herpes, or being on chemotherapy. So if you like have cancer and you're on drugs that are suppressing your immune system, this can erythema multiform can um, can flare up basically. And I was in this really small category of people, like less than like it's like one percent of cases. So it's like one percent of cases of a disease that's already very rare. Um, of people that just get it, what they say due to environmental reasons, which basically is like, we don't really know, but it's kind of how you're living <laughs> is causing this. And so, you know, the doctors are asking me these questions of like, are you stressed out? I'm like, yes. How much are you drinking? A lot. How much do you sleep? Not at all. How long has this been going on? Several years. So I think it was a combination of like the stress hormones the cortisol, substance abuse, lack of sleep, pressure. And then I, I mean, it's like this weird kind of, I don't know, like spiritual thing of just, just being in the wrong place and living the wrong life. And this was my body's way of just saying like, you can't keep doing this. I would notice that I would, I would usually have outbreaks after I would travel for work and I would have to present and do a bunch of meetings and all of that. And I always found that to be really stressful. And it was oftentimes right when I got back from traveling that I would have these outbreaks, which I think was a combination of like being on the plane and being surrounded by people's like sneezing and coughing and like just having my immune system like activated. And then also like time zones, you know, like going to the East Coast or whatever, Europe and like coming back and just having my sleep disrupted. It was all of that. And then also just hating those work trips and um that's when i decided like once i got the diagnosis and i could like start some medication that would treat it and that kind of thing it was like i'm not going to keep doing this first of all um that's a that's a story that while i know there's a lot of folks can empathize with it it's like just hearing it from you again in person this time it's really Mind blowing, and I'm so glad to see you healthy. I'm so glad to see that you turned this to amazing work that you're doing. But the pain that you went through, I cannot even imagine. Um, and secondly, it's very interesting uh, that book that you also refer to. Uh, Our body really keeps a score. Yeah, it's. Like I had a similar experience and folks who are listeners, they're familiar with that, like my back pain and like how, what I went through. Mm -hmm. And what I realized is like this job of like sitting behind a desk for eight, 10 hours a day, that's not my thing. My, my body is not built for it. It is built for somebody, but my body is not built for it. It, it was not even ready for it. So now that I'm, doing the work that I'm doing right now, which is not sitting behind the desk for eight, nine to 10 hours, sometimes 14 hours a day. Now life is completely different. I'm experiencing some of the happiest days of my life, uh, not because I'm making like, and having a very great life, just because I think I'm using my body and my emotions for what it's built for. What was that moment for you? Like, what do you think that life is for you, for Jesse? What does that look like? Well, I think for a really long time, I didn't actually believe that I deserved to be happy. And so I was willing to put up with work that didn't make me happy because that was my way of punishing myself so that I could then believe that I deserved some kind of happiness. It was like the fact that the work was difficult and painful was what made me able to earn some positive reward for it on the other side. And I think that's because like at some point in my life, and I think this is true for a lot of people, you make a connection between suffering and deserving. Like if I suffer through A, I will deserve to get B. If I outwork this person, then I will deserve to get the job and they won't. And so the idea of happiness or pleasure or satisfaction always existed on the other side of more pain. 
and you know there's a whole depth of psychoanalysis you can get into with that with like early childhood experiences and your everybody's personal history and psychology around reward punishment worthiness love connection attachment we could get into some of that if you want to but when i stopped working in tech it wasn't just that i decided i'm gonna switch careers because something else sounds more fun it was because i fundamentally changed my belief about myself and my self-worth and the first thing that i came to recognize was i deserve to be happy regardless of what i do at work everybody does like my intentions for people are good. I'm a good person and I want other people to live loving, joyous lives. That's what I would want for them. So I'm going to want that for myself now. And making that shift really changed things because now I'm podcasting full time and I'm building this business. And, you know, depending on how it goes, like I'm, might have to go back into the workforce and get another job at some point and that's totally fine but i'm going to be finding a job that i can humbly do in order to make a paycheck that keeps me moving so i can continue to pursue my dream and do what i'm doing with this podcast which is so different than what my mindset to work was 2 or 3 or 4 years ago like Whatever job I do next, if I do one, my goal with that job is not like to get rich so that I'm worthy of God loving me. The goal is to make some money so I can pay rent with my wife, which is like a lot less pressure. That is so well said. Uh, it's It also reminded me of two words. You said, if we want to talk more about that, I think it's actually a good place to throw these two key words. Uh, being nice versus being kind. Does this resonate with you in any shape or form? Yeah, I mean, being nice is manners, basically, like following, like, I mean, I, this is an open to interpretation, but when I think about ni being nice, it's basically keeping positive and saying things that will generally make people feel happy thoughts or have a happy experience. And so, that's great. Being nice is like totally cool. I feel like being kind is the next level of intention where you're planning the way that you interact with people so that they feel recognized and their gifts have space to express themselves. And you're opening opportunities for them to have personal victories that's what kindness looks like to me yeah and the reason i throw that out was this morning as i was like just going through my own writings uh that was like the sort of like the two keywords came up to me and as you were saying i'm like this is the best place for me to ask this question and see what jesse thinks because i feel like the paradigm you were talking about in the workforce is that oftentimes we are trying to be the nice employees. Mm -hmm. We are trying to do the nice thing to get to work with that reward system, which is going to give us some promotions or which is going to just tell us, oh, great job, Ali. Great job, Jesse. You guys did so much. Uh, and then it's that, and that's one way. And then the other way is to be kind. And to be kind to others, I think the, the little difference to me and what I wrote down for myself was to be kind, you have to be first kind to yourself so that you can mm -hmm. be kind to others. Like you find kindness internally rather than you find niceness externally. And that was kind of like the paradigm I saw in what you were saying. And what I actually think was the change of mindset for me when I shifted and it took a very long time, still working on it. But when I shifted from thinking being nice versus being kind, does that in any shape or form resonates with you? And what do you think about this? It definitely resonates with me. And I made a 
few clips from that episode about just some points where I remarked on finding almost self-respect and self-love and, and, and self com like compassion. And I got, I had a hater when I posted that clip. I don't remember if it was on Instagram or it was a YouTube short or something like that. But like, basically I, I, I said, you know, through this difficult time, I figured out how to love myself. And the person's comment was, you know, you're so full of yourself. You're not, your life's not that interesting. Like basically shut up. And it was so perfect because somebody who loves themselves would never take the time to write that comment about somebody else. And I know that feeling of like seeing other people talk about self-love and being like, oh, that's kind of phony. So I like I totally understand where that person was coming from. I get it. And there is a little bit of a cringe factor. I don't actually think this, but people think there's like a cringe factor of like recognizing your inherent value and worthiness as a human being. And if you do that publicly, if you recognize yourself and, and validate yourself in that way, people who don't feel that can feel threatened by it because it's like a mirror that they then look at themselves and they don't see that they love themselves in that way. So how could anyone else? Well, it has to be BS. And then they're angry and that hurts them. And so then they're angry that somebody would point that out and then they lash out and they take that anger out. So this phenomenon of like getting in touch with your kindness is very resonates with me because people don't get upset about niceness. People don't get upset if you hold the door for someone when they go to walk in or you say, have a nice day. Like that's generally just an accepted way to be, but like, actually showing kindness can even be threatening to people which is like mind-blowing that was a great example and thank you thank you for adding to this uh i i, w I wasn't sure when i throw that keyword what would happen but this this was perfect do you think um or do you see uh some of these some more of these hater behavior uh, hater behavior out there uh, in what you're publishing. Because I think what's interesting uh, is, again, just because I have some understanding, but tell me if it's wrong. Because you're publishing other people's story, uh, parts of those story may not resonate with everybody, you know? Mm -hmm. And like, it, it, if it was all about Jesse, people could start learning about Jesse and it could build that empathy about one person or one lifestyle rather than what you're doing is really hard. You're trying to move people around to different corners of this war, to this different corners of all this big book that you want to show to everyone. Do you hear any other uh, activity like that that you mentioned or are there any other paradigms similar to this that sometimes makes you... Um, feel not necessarily loved i had a guest david lindner on a few weeks ago and david's a business professional he's an athlete but he also got a very serious cancer diagnosis when he was in his early 30s mid 30s and it almost killed him and luckily it didn't and he had a major surgery and i mean he had to have a bunch of his liver taken out and some other parts of his body is very intense but he lived and he's fine and as far as we know now like the cancer's 100% gone he uh he saw this cancer diagnosis as an opportunity for personal growth and it made him more in touch with his love for his family and his wife and his kids and the kind of person that he wants to be and he had been reading a lot of the stoic philosophers before his cancer diagnosis. And as he said, generally his life was pretty good. I mean, like everybody life had up and ups and downs, but he was kind of living the American dream. He was doing well. Everything was almost taken away from him and he had to practice the philosophy that he had been reading. Like he had to practice it for real, like with the stoicism and seeing challenges as an opportunity for growth. It was like, here's your chance, man. And somebody commented on the video 
so like the the thumbnail for the video was next level stoicism because i'm like to me that's like the next level like if you can see cancer as an opportunity for personal growth like for me like running a few miles is right so like that was my thumbnail next level stoicism and this guy goes how about next level ego and you know it's just like man you cannot make every anybody you cannot make everybody happy like david is like the least egoic guy like everyone it's crazy too because i when i posted on linkedin and update on the podcast like a ton of people in david's network commented on my post like people that i didn't know but like were david's colleagues and ex bosses or people that had worked on his teams and people sent me dms that were like david is one of the most honorable, respectful people I've ever had the pleasure of working with. I didn't even know that he like went through this. Like I was like work like David was one of our clients like during this time frame. I didn't even know he was sick. Like the point being like David goes through this whole thing, goes through these surgeries and like he doesn't even tell everybody that this is what he's facing. Like this is not a guy with like ego about his story at all. And still somebody like had to make that comment. And, you know, this just gets into like shadow work. Like the things that we hate in other people are just things we are not comfortable with in ourselves across the board. So uh, I hope folks who are listening uh, start like figuring out like what uh, this mission of letting stories out and telling stories, it, it's really hard to manage. And I salute you from here. I know. Um, how sometimes those conversations can go different ways and really managing and understanding how to manage those conversations. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a tough job and doing it full time. I think it's, it's going to be a lot for you, but I'm glad it's, it's something that, uh, folks, you are taking, uh, very good steps to keep our mental health uh, in a good state. We are all having an, our own routine. We are developing our own routine. I did a little bit of research about you again, and I know you're doing jujitsu. I know you're doing some other activities. You mentioned coaching. What are some of the things that you're doing to continuously keeping your mental health at the state that you want it to be? Um, and what is your guardrail and what are the tools you use? Yeah. So there's universal principles that I think apply. And then there's what I'm doing. And on a universal level, just deciding to have a mental health routine is the first step, which is not something I thought that I needed or even was aware that like I knew about physical exercise because I was an athlete as a kid and in college and all of that. I was like, yeah, okay, you train. And I understood learning for the purposes of skill acquisition, but actual mental health practices as a routine was something that was not real for me. It felt like a very low priority and life kicked my butt hard enough that it became necessary for me to develop a routine. And so I think, you know, the first thing I would just say is like, I saw this meme or something. It was like, someone was like talking to their therapist and they were like, so I haven't been outside. I haven't exercised. I haven't practiced my hobby. I haven't ha gone on a social engagement. I haven't found work that is meaningful to me. I'm very depressed. What can you prescribe me? And it's like, you know, psychiatric disorders and, and depression and all of that. Like this is, this is complex stuff. And I'm certainly not a, not a doctor. And I will say like, I've taken antidepressants. I, I did a couple years ago and it really helped me for a few months. So I'm, I'm not, everyone should do whatever they figure out with their doctor, but like beyond those medications, sunlight, sleep, decent diet, making time for social activities, the basic stuff that you hear about, if you search chat GPT or Google, like what are, what are some free things? Like, what are some things I can do for free? that will help my mental health like they all help they're all real my answer to that if someone told me that a few years ago would have been i don't have time for that and it's like well yeah the fact that i don't have time for that is connected to why i feel so bad 
there has to be some reevaluation there. And it's tough because for a person who's depressed, there's mental health issues like bipolar and schizophrenia that I'm like, I'm really not qualified to talk about. So like really what I'm talking about is just like depression and anxiety. Those are the things that I have felt myself that I have managed to overcome for the most part. So that's like, that's what I'm focusing on here. If you are feeling depressed, I have so much compassion because a, a de- for a depressed person, motivating to go exercise is way harder than a person who's not depressed. Like the things that will help you are the hardest to do when you're really depressed. And so for me, when I was like at my worst and so depressed, I had to go get professional help. And professional help looked like therapy and a Wellbutrin prescription. And those two things in combination took me from literally just needing to like sleep all day and just like feeling absolutely devastated. Like from the moment I woke up to the moment I fell asleep, I just felt awful. Taking the antidepressant and being in therapy gave me a baseline where I could like start going for walks. And I had the energy to have better conversations with my wife. And I could plan a trip for us on the weekend to go to a farm to go pet llamas. And we could get tickets to a concert and go into the city and do it. And I could be around groups of people and not have like this just like crushing anxiety. So like when I was at my absolute worst, I needed those tools to get me to a baseline. And then once I got to a baseline, consistent daily exercise And this is for me, like not everybody needs to exercise seven days a week, I'm sure. For me, it's got to be seven days a week. And it has to be intense exercise. That's just like what I need. And um, I do jujitsu, which is also social. So you're around other people. So like for me, it's really beneficial because I get my exercise in and I like make my friends at the gym and it's my community. And like it challenges me and I get into a flow state. And so that, and I get out of the house. It's indoors, so I'm not technically in the sun. But like even just when I drive down to the gym, like I put my my windows down in the car and uh, my sunscreen or whatever, the the roof window, what do you call it? The moon roof, whatever it is. I open that up. So I've got like the wind coming in, the sun coming in. and. I do all of that and that helps a lot. And then the other one, which was like really tough is just like finding work that's meaningful for me. Those things together, I'm in a really, really, really good place. I got to say, I like how you saw that as a journey and a multi-layer strategy Mm -hmm. where you're starting with some universal rule, like, hey, the fact that I need to have a routine for my mental health, I should know that that's my right. That's, that's something I should, that's like baseline. I should have something. Then first, what is the first layer for me? I know depending on my situation, I can do either therapy now or this. I don't have to just, I don't have to get to a level that Jesse is and like does seven days of exercise yet. No, There no. are layers like, we go yeah. s- step by step. It, it's not going to go away overnight. That depression is not going to go away overnight. It takes work. And for that, you need a multi-layer strategy. I think this is what I'm consistently hearing from folks is that eventually one kind of like physical activity is included that is well suited for that person. Mm-hmm. I hear somebody says yoga, somebody says jujitsu seven days a week or X days a week. I have my own routine. And like when I see it, I'm like, there is something about finding that calm and finding that mental health in our body and in paying attention to our body the way it deserves. And I, I really love kicking on how everybody is like taking care of their physics. Um, it's interesting to see 
uh, and to hear you're doing seven days workout, I want to ask a question. What is your workout routine actually for those seven days? Is it like every day, same thing, or each day has its own plan? How many days is jujitsu? Yeah, happy to. This is so fun for me. I'm like so happy to talk about daily routine stuff because, you know, as someone who loves podcasts and loves listening to podcasts like about optimization and all of these different things, like for years, I've been hearing people talk about their daily routines and I'm like, oh my God, now I get to talk about my daily routine. So like, this is such a gift for me. Thank you so and much. And now you summarize all of the best of best for us. So this is actually a super episode. So let's yeah. do it. <laughs> yeah, this is awesome. Thank you. Okay. So when I wake up in the morning, the first thing that I do is I get sunlight. So I get out of the house as soon as possible. I used to drink a bunch of coffee at this time. I now drink a coffee substitute called Mad Dandy, which is has some coffee in it. I think it's about as strong as a decaf cup of coffee, but it mainly has different mushroom adaptogens, turmeric, that kind of thing. It's basically like an herbal and mushroom blend. Um, Mad Dandy, anyone can get it. It's about the same price as coffee. It gives that same coffee satisfying taste of a warm drink that it's like this like dark liquid herbal thing it like smells really good it tastes good but it's probably a third as much caffeine as a regular cup of coffee and that for me is enough to like get me going but doesn't give me that anxiousness or the neurotic kind of action that i would get from just starting with too much caffeine so that's where i start with and then i immediately start doing my journaling which is based on a series of prompts that i have and there's like 20 of them we could talk about that but it's like a separate conversation because that part goes super deep but like there's a million different ways to journal i think one of the most powerful ones is literally just stream of consciousness there is no prompt you sit down and you just start writing or typing whatever format you want to use and you give yourself let's just say 10 or 15 minutes to do it. I've evolved a whole system on top of that, but like, that's a great place to start. And that's where I started. And it helped me tremendously. Once I am finished with my journaling, I'll have a small snack. Um, and then I'll take a walk for usually about 10 or 15 minutes just to get the blood flowing 20 at the, at the most. And then I work. And it's at that point, like a three and a half to four hour work session. I take meetings, I record podcasts, I edit, I post on social media, all of that kind of stuff. I'm doing some consulting work right now as well. So some of that gets rolled into it. And then I go to the noon jujitsu class and I do that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And if I'm around on the we leave town sometimes, but if I'm in town, then I go to the Saturday class as well. So it's six days of jujitsu. And then most afternoons, I also lift weights at about six or seven at night as my transition. So after jujitsu, I do another work session for another like three or four hours. And then I lift weights and I'm done with that. So I frequently work out twice a day. The weightlifting session is usually pretty short, like 30 minutes. Um, and it's not super intense. Like it's kind of just moving the weight around. It feels good for me. We open up the garage. I have my weights in the garage. I open it up. So I have like the sun coming through and that's how I do it. But I, I do miss like some days I will miss the weight training session for sure. Yeah. That is fantastic. And just like, uh, I hope my, I, I didn't interrupt. I, I, I was just like so excited hearing this. I hope my change of face didn't bother this conversation, but I was just so excited hearing you do jujitsu six days a week. And that's, that's amazing, man. Like it's what, what is special about jujitsu? I I've been hearing it a lot. I've done different kind of martial arts, never done jujitsu. What's special about it? Like if you want to, if you want to sell it to me in one minute, how would you sell it? It's the most fun martial art. Like fundamentally, I do it because it's really fun. When you watch people practice jujitsu, like when you watch them compete and you don't know jujitsu, it's really hard to figure out what's going on. Like 
these bodies are kind of like just rolling all over each other in these different like configurations and shapes. It's hard to tell who's winning. It's like when you watch a boxing match, one person is like punching the other person in the face. It's pretty clear that like one person's beating the other person up in jujitsu. It's very technical. It looks like they're rock climbing, but there's no wall. They're like rock climbing another person or something like you have no idea what's going on when you're in it and you're actually doing it. It's this three dimensional chess. You are playing with your body against another person. So it's three dimensions because you can be on your back performing techniques on your side. You can be standing up. The other person can be on their back. You can be wrapped around their shoulders. You can be wrapped around their legs, their arms. So there's all of these different configurations where like one person is above the other person, below the other person, side to side. It's like definitely a three-dimensional space that you're existing in. And what's amazing about it is in jujitsu, the goal is to tap the other person out. It's to get them to submit. And like that, it's called tapping them out because literally they, they tap when they're done. They're like, ow, that hurts too much. Or you're choking me. And so I give up. When you tap, the game is over, which means you don't actually take any damage. Like injuries in sports, in any sport, happen. It's very rare in jujitsu. It's honestly very rare in jujitsu. Like you can go a very long time in jujitsu and not get injured. And just like anything, you play soccer or whatever, you can twist your knee, you can break your arm. Like you can injure yourself. In jujitsu, the same way, like if you're someone who skis, skiing is way more dangerous than jujitsu. So like jujitsu is like a walk in the park in terms of like the potential for injury, but it's just so fun. And what I love about it is you can do it a hundred percent and not injure the other person because they tap and then it's over. Whereas like if you're boxing and you go a hundred percent, you're going to knock them out. You're going to give them brain damage. Yeah. So like I used to do, you know, like Muay Thai and kickboxing and boxing and stuff. And I love that stuff. But, you know, you would leave a day of sparring and have a headache. And it's like, I know that's not good for me. Mm. So jujitsu fills that that space where it's like you want to have that feeling of combat, but you don't actually want to hurt yourself or somebody else. It's like perfect for that. OK, I'm going to promise. I'm going to give it a try. How about that? Give it a try. Yeah. I'm going to give it, give it a, a try. try. There are so many offline. Let me know that there's a million gyms around where you live. I'll be happy to recommend one if you want. Perfect. Yeah. I'm definitely going to uh, ask you for that. Thank you so much. Like This was a, I, I never had this much sports conversation in any of our episodes. I, I think you are the right person given the depth of routine you built here and the depth of studies I know you've done to make it happen to yourself. So thank you so much for hacking all of that into this part of the conversation. I love it. I'm going to come back to it and listen to it again myself. Um, I want to go to a part of our episodes that I personally, uh, I always like to ask our uh, guests to commit to an accountability campaign that they do an activity that they like that keeps their mental health in a good state, they would do that for 30 days with some of our listeners. So aside from jujitsu, <laughs> which is a great one, but is not for everybody. Yeah. And that's totally fine. Yeah. I mean, I think I would have to go back to the morning pages stream of consciousness writing. Most of the writing that we do, I mean, all of the writing that we do that is not that is based on our work about getting something done and some kind of productivity and like to have this new relationship with writing or to reinvigorate this relationship with writing where it's creative and you discover yourself, I think is super beautiful. And it's like, it's free. If you can afford a piece of paper and a pen, or if you already have a phone, like if you are watching this, <laughs> this episode, you have the ability to write. So 
just, and it's like, it doesn't have to be a crazy amount of time. Like I think setting a 10 minute timer in the morning and just writing a street, like literally just the first word, first sentence. And like that first sentence could be, this is so stupid. I don't know why I'm doing this writing activity that Jesse Marseille recommended on this podcast. It's a great podcast, but I can't believe I'm doing it. Like, <laughs> you know, like that's, you're going to, that's in, that is a great start. So that's what I would recommend morning journaling, stream of consciousness, just go for it. Man, the synchro synchronicity of this is just crazy to me. I just finished a 10 days of doing journaling with my Persian community in my other podcasts. Yeah. Uh, that we have like these 10 day challenges and the activity for that was journaling for 10 days. And I am hearing now the feedback from the audience. They've, they've loved it. And now you're opening a 30 day uh, a contest here for people to join you and do that 10 or 15 minutes per day of journaling. I can tell you that it's been life changing for me. And I know people and I, I started doing it. I know people who are replacing it with even their morning meditation. It's becoming a way mm -hmm. of meditating in the morning. Thank you for bringing that as a gift to the show. Uh, so I, I will be posting the details for uh, this campaign. And uh, also, you mentioned a couple of other books. I'm going to put the links to all those into the show notes as well. Uh, I would love to start like wrapping up this episode. Uh, thank you so much for coming to this show. Is there any final thoughts, anything that you want to share uh, about this conversation we had? Anything you want to share with the audience before we end this? I just think like the biggest thing is people have the answers within themselves. and when you go to a coach or a mentor, you know, you, 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 you go to them because they're an expert and you take everything you can get from them. And then fundamentally the truth is inside of you. And so whether it's through journaling or meditation or just going on a walk outside, like just trust that you have the truth and it might take longer than you want to reveal it, but it's there if you continue to engage with it and it's a it's a beautiful thing just find that inner voice and listen to it that was uh well needed for me and as you were saying uh that some of these topics need more conversation you sparked an idea that i love to have you back on the show so i you don't have to commit now i will talk to you later but i really love to have you and continue these conversations because we we opened some parts of the dialogue and i think we can go deeper in some of them thanks again for coming to this conversation jesse and bringing your story and your love for the people around you thank you so much thank you so much it's been a joy for me and thank you so much to your audience as well thanks everyone awesome have a good day